In an 1861 Benedictine devotional, there is a section containing a litany to the saints of the Benedictine order. In this litany are popes, martyrs, doctors, abbots, monks, and nuns. Some names are familiar. Scholastico, Anselm, Bede, Bernard, Hildegard. Others a bit more obscure, Willibod, Elfidge, Walburga, Grimbald, and others. This devotion to the Benedictine saints makes clear that the way of Saint Benedict leads to the way of holiness and a life of virtue. The hallmark of the Benedictine life is the sacred liturgy. Through contact with the sacred liturgy, these Benedictines achieve the goal of the Christian life, union with God and eternal life. Similarly, those who commit themselves to this way of prayer can follow where their ancestors have trod. The title of this talk is Monastic Life, Virtues, and the Sacred Liturgy. I would like to narrow down this broad subject into a more precise topic. It is the divine office as prayer and the path of virtue through a monastic lens. In the course of this talk, I will focus on three themes, the divine office and prayer, the divine office and monasticism, and the divine office and the virtues. The divine office and prayer. The first question to be asked is, what is the divine office? What is the liturgy of the hours or the work of God? Many people think it is the praying of the Psalms by religious, priests, monks, and nuns. But that concept is not adequate. The dogmatic constitution on the sacred liturgy, Sacrosanctum Concilium, states that the divine office is Christ Jesus joining the entire community of mankind to himself, associating with his own singing of this canticle of divine praise. It is the prayer of Christ and the church. As a prayer of the people of God, it involves priests, monks, and nuns, but it also includes all the faithful. As baptized members, the people of God share in the common priesthood of Christ, whereby they have a right and duty to offer fitting worship to the divine majesty. This activity of worship is what it means to be an adopted child of God. Sacrosanctum Concilium states, quote, All who render this service are not only fulfilling a duty of the church, but also are sharing in the greatest honor of Christ's spouse. Unquote. When the faithful praise the Lord, they perform what brings them total fulfillment because by praying, they are acting in accord with their created nature. As the saying goes, birds fly, fish swim, and man prays, attributed to the Desert Fathers. Prayer is the distinctive activity of being human. The baptized faithful necessarily have a role in this prayer, but the true prayer, the essence of the liturgy, is a work of the Most Holy Trinity. 
through the Incarnation, the eternal prayer of the second person of the Trinity took on a human dimension. In the words of the sacred liturgy, Sacrosanctum Concilium, quote, Christ Jesus, High Priest of the New and Eternal Covenant, taking human nature, introduced into this earthly exile, that hymn which is sung throughout all the ages in the halls of heaven. It is the very prayer of Christ himself, together with his body, addressed to the Father." Unquote. Christ's prayer becomes the prayer of his mystical body, for there is an intimate and necessary relationship between the prayer of Christ and the prayer of the whole human race. Christ, through the Incarnation, has wedded humanity to himself. Through baptism, the faithful are incorporated into his mystical body, and he gives them the power of adoring and praising the Father. Throughout the liturgy, what happens is eternal, outside of space and time, but is made present in a concrete reality of a visible church gathered at prayer. Marmion writes, quote, It is the praise of Christ, the incarnate word, passing through the lips of the church. Unquote. This intimate union of Christ and his church is such that his words become their words, and in praying the divine office, through this prayer, one gets caught up into the communion of the Most Holy Trinity. Man is brought to the threshold of eternity and the beatific vision. The general instruction of the Liturgy of the Hours reads, It is a foretaste of the heavenly praises, unceasing before the throne of God and the Lamb, our intimate union with the Church in heaven. With this view in mind, it is clear that the activity of liturgical prayer far surpasses any other activity which man can engage. All other prayers and devotions are the prayers of man, but the liturgy is the prayer of Christ. Sacrosanctum Concilium reads, quote, Every liturgical celebration because it is an action of Christ the priest and of his body, which is the church, is a sacred action surpassing all others. No other action of the church can equal its efficacy. This prayer of, the, of Christ to the Father has the words of the sacred scriptures as its foundation. The divine and human element of the sacred scriptures is described in De Verbum, quote, Indeed, the words of God, expressed in the words of men, are in every way like human language. Just as the word of the Eternal Father, when he took on himself the flesh of human weakness, became like men. Unquote. Our Lord, while on earth, found the sacred scriptures to be that fount of prayer. In particular, the Psalms held great meaning. These Psalms, inspired by the Holy Spirit, written down by men and prayed by Christ, provide the solid foundation for the liturgy of the hours. The Psalms are, in every way, the book of prayer. And so as Christians who desire to delve deeply into the mystery of God's love for humanity through Christ, the Psalms are the gateway into this transcending love. The Psalms, as the inspired Word of God, provide a guaranteed mode of sanctification. Isaiah says, quote, Just as from the heavens the rain and snow come down, and do not return there till they have watered the earth, making it fertile and fruitful, so giving seed to the one who sows and bread to the one who eats, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. 
It shall not return to me empty, but shall do what pleases me, achieving the end for which I sent it." Unquote. This word which came down from God will once more go up to him, but before returning to him, the word has been given a mission, namely that of the glory of God and the sanctification of man. Once the word has achieved this, it will necessarily ascend in the praises to the Father. These are the sacred texts used during the divine office. The words are not simply inspiring, they are inspired. Therefore, it is not a question of whether or not the word will accomplish its task. It will do what God sent it to do. By the animating power of the Holy Spirit, virtue will be planted in the hearts of men by the steady daily rhythm of the Psalms. The Psalms, while having the influence, influence of words of men, have a divine quality. Bonhoeffer writes that Christ in Christ, the words of men become the words of God. He is that perfect spoken word of the Father, which fully expresses who is the Father. Thus the Psalms find their fullest expression when they are placed upon the lips of Christ. When the faithful pray the Psalms, they pray in union with Christ. Their prayer is united to the eternal prayer of Christ to the Father in the Holy Spirit. Their prayer is Trinitarian. This constant prayer of the Church in union with Christ fosters that prayerful dialogue without which no growth in relationship is possible. The general instruction of the Liturgy of the Hour reads, quote, The sanctification of man and the worship of God is achieved in the Liturgy of the Hours by setting up a dialogue between God and man so that God speaks to his people and the people re reply to God both in song and prayer. The praying of the Psalms provides that dialogue that is necessary of every relationship. In this case, the relationship is between the creature and the creator. As Marmion says, worship is also a conversation, an exchange. In the Psalms, God speaks to man, and man returns a word to God in prayer. the divine office and monasticism. This means of prayer was recognized in the early church. The Acts of the Apostles clearly demonstrates the regular interval of prayer in the early church. There we read of the disciples gathered together at the third hour. The prince of the apostles went up to the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. At midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. This pattern of periodic prayer was by no means lost as the church advanced in wisdom and in grace. At each step of the day, the prayer of the people of God was used to deepen that relationship with God and the channeling of divine grace. Very early in the monastic tradition, and very much an essential component of the life, was the praying of the Psalms. The saying of the Desert Fathers speak of the importance of the Psalms. One such saying reads, quote, A monk was praising himself to Epiphanius saying, We do not neglect our appointed round of psalms, but we are very careful to recite Tears, Sext, and Known. But Epiphanius responded, The true monk should have prayer and the psalms 
continually in his heart. John Cashin, writing in the 5th century, notes a debate arising between monks about the number of psalms to be prayed during the night office. Some monks who were stronger stated that 50 or 60 psalms ought to be prayed. Others rebuked them at their lack of compassion on the weakness of their brothers. During the argument, somebody appeared to them, sang 12 psalms, and left, and that settled the debate. Both of these stories indicate the importance of the psalms for the heroes of the desert. St. Benedict, in picking up from this monastic tradition, also saw the necessity of praying the psalms for the growth in virtue. In his Holy Rule, which is about 73 chapters, he devotes 13 to the psalms, which is over one-sixth of the Holy Rule. St. Benedict recognizes the proximity with which, with which one comes to God through the divine office. He writes, quote, We believe that the divine presence is everywhere, and that in every place the eyes of the Lord are watching the good and the wicked. But beyond the least doubt, we should believe this to be especially true when we celebrate the divine office. He realized that not all monks had the capacity to recite all 150 psalms every day. Understanding human weakness, he was able to construct a way of life for the every jo everyday Joe monk to be sanctified. He therefore allowed for moderation, saying that all 150 psalms were to be prayed in a week. But still, he wrote that nothing is to be preferred to the work of God. Nothing. Not personal prayer, not other monks or other people, not other works, absolutely nothing. The praying of the Psalms developed in the period of Pope St. Gregory the Great, the great Benedictine monk who became Pope. He made a great contribution to the musical heritage that we now call Gregorian chant. There is an image of the Holy Spirit in a form of a dove whispering into his ear as he composes Gregorian chant to be used in the psalmody of the divine office. It is important to note that Gregory was not simply any person, but was Pope, the chief steward of the liturgy for the universal church. This connection of sacred music to the sacred liturgy is quite profound. Macaro, quoting Plato, writes that music is the art of so ordering sound as to reach the soul inspiring a love of virtue. Kevin Irwin writes that music is required for the integrity of the act of worship. The celebration of the divine office, apart from music, is far less than ideal and only realizes its fullness when sacred music is joined to the sacred text. John Mayendorf adds that the sacred arts are a necessary helpmate to the sacred liturgy, for liturgy involves the whole man without despising any functions of the soul or the body. Words of themselves have a certain level of force, but they are only able to reach the intellect. Thus the full person is not engaged in the act of receiving the word. However, when the word, the word of faith is set to music, then it becomes alive. Human experience attests that the recitation of the psalms pales considerably in comparison with psalmody set to music. Why is this? St. Augustine puts it succinctly, singing is for the one who loves. The words of the Psalms reaches the mind, 
but only when it is set to song, it touches the human heart. Only with music can the person enter into the communal prayer between the Father and the Son in the Holy Spirit. Because this communion is born of love, and love desires to be expressed through song. This power of music can be realized even at a human secular level. Boethius, referencing Plato, states that there is no greater ruin of morals in a republic than the gradual perversion of chaste and temperate music. Reverend Basil Nortz notes that a teacher was once exiled from a Greek city because he added a string to one of their traditional instruments. The adding of a string took away from the modest style of the instrument that characterizes virtue. The Divine Office and the Virtues The use of Gregorian chant in the Divine Office is itself a means of growth and sanctification through the cultivation of the virtues. Virtues as good habits necessarily need to be practiced regularly. For example, if a monk wants to grow in the virtue of silence, a very concrete way of doing this is by opening and closing doors quietly. It may sound like a small action, hardly worth anything at all, but imagine how many times a day a door is open and closed. Every time the monk opens it quietly, he is reminding himself of the value of silence and of its importance in seeking God. Over time, through habit, he gains an appreciation of and values silence. The method of chant similarly allows the virtues to be cultivated in much the same way. Chant in its form disposes man to aff and affirms him in the virtuous life. It helps him grow both in the evangelical counsels and the theological virtues. By chanting hour after hour, day after day, the virtues associated with the chanting of the office gradually become infused in the soul. The evangelical counsels are poverty, chastity, and obedience. Chant po fosters poverty. It uses a limited set of notes. The psalm tones are often repeated. This is something of a tonal poverty. It is an act of sacrifice on the part of the chanters for the sake of simplicity and poverty. Chant lowers itself behind the words, truly lifting up and ac accenting the words of the sacred text. Thus chant does not draw attention to itself, but seeks to be a humble servant of the word. It is not a performance type music, but allows through its poverty for the listeners to enter deeply into that sacred mystery that is the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, who was born poor, lived poor, and died poor. One of the starkest applications of this tonal poverty is the use of recto tono, that is, the chanting of the Psalms on a single note. While seemingly simple, a psalm done well in recto tono can allow the soul and mind to, mind to rise to God in utter simplicity. Chant also fosters chastity. It is moderate in its use. It does not seek to draw attention to itself saying, listen to me, I'm awesome. It does nothing to entertain, charm, or possess the other. Day after day in the choir, Similar notes and tones are played, and at times this can be a real chastisement for the soul. However, in this there is growth in chastity. The last evangelical counsel is obedience. 
Gregorian chant is obedient to the sacred text of Scripture. It does not attempt to create better words for the sacred liturgy, but rather uses the words of sacred Scripture and the words provided by the Church. Also, by using Gregorian chant, one is being obedient to the desires of Holy Mother Church, as she has consistently pointed out in her teachings on sacred music. These prominent figures are Pius X, Pius XII, John Paul II, and Benedict XVI, not to mention the dogmatic constitution on the sacred liturgy. There is also a growth in the theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity. Praying the Psalms helps one to grow in faith because day after day he prays the office, professing his belief in the unseen God. It is only by faith that anyone would endeavor to waste his time with prayer. Whereas the world would think of him as a fool, he is wise in the eyes of God. For that reason, the contemplative life is eschatological because it points to the unseen reality. It declares that sooner or later life will come to an end. When people see 30 or 40 men dressed in black robes, they think, there has to be a reason for this. By faith, monks go to the Abbey Church to praise God many times during the day. Each act of going to choir is a reaffirmation of their faith in the living God, in whom they have placed their hope. The praying of the Psalms fosters hope. Hope that what he does has meaning. Perfecte Caritatis reads that there is a hidden apostolic fruitfulness in the, in the contemplative life. With all these evils going on in the world, the monk must hope against hope, believing that his fidelity to praying the liturgy of the church is winning a crown for those in the world. He hopes that his prayers will save souls. A story of the Desert Fathers articulates this realized hope. Quote, One day, Abba Serapian passed through an Egyptian village, and there he saw a courtesan, a prostitute, who stayed in her own cell. The old man said to her, Expect me this evening, for, for I would like to come and spend the night with you. She replied, Very well, Abba. She got ready and made the bed. When the evening came, the old man came to see her and entered her cell and said to her, Have you got the bed ready? She said, Yes, Abba. Then he closed the door and said to her, Wait, we have a rule of prayer, and I must fulfill that first. So the old man began his prayers. He took the psalter, and at each psalm he said a prayer for the courtesan, begging God that she might be converted and saved. And God heard him. The woman stood trembling and praying beside the old man. The woman was filled with compunction. Unquote. Abba Serapion hoped that the divine office would save the courtesan, and his hope did not disappoint. Lastly, the chanting of the Psalms nourishes the virtue of love. Truly, the Psalms are the words of one lover to another. At times, there are words of profound desire. O God, you are my God, for you I long. Or, my heart and my flesh cry out, O God, my living God. At other times, it expresses trust. The Lord is my light and my salvation and hope. I believe that I shall see the good things of the Lord in the land of the living, or sorrow. Have mercy on me, O God, a sinner. The Psalms allow the monk day after day 
to enter into that pure dialogue of the Most Holy Trinity, the heart desires nothing more than to be in loving communion with the Lord. The theological and evangelical councils need one other dimension that is not described as a virtue, and that is the notion of sacrifice. The chanting of the divine office is truly a sacrifice. Anyone who has chanted the divine office year after year recognizes this reality. It is by no means separate from the virtues, but very much in every way enhances the virtues of faith, hope, and charity, poverty, chastity, and obedience. Marmion says, quote, Suffering gives to love a special splendor and a singular value. To love God in suffering is truly the height of self-oblation. Unquote. Christ loved both the Heavenly Father and the whole of humanity throughout his life. But this was manifested in a supreme way during his agony on the cross. The divine office is a sacrifice worthy of God. It becomes at times, in the words of the psalmist, a sacrifice of praise. There are thorns of tiny annoyances, such as someone singing off tune, another moving in a particular way, standing next to someone one does not like, fatigue, sore feet, aching back, restlessness, heat, coldness, and under all these circumstances, he gathers every day, not just once or twice, but five, six, seven, or even eight times a day. This mingling of suffering to the divine office adds an extra layer of honor given to the divine majesty. Love is purified, faith is elevated, hope endures, obedience is perfected, and chastity grows. Thus one praises God not only when one feels his consolations and are filled with zeal, but also in the desolation, darkness, even when there is no desire to pray the divine office. But when this sacrifice of praise is embraced, it becomes for the monk a way of salvation, beatitude, peace. He has given over everything of himself to God, holding nothing back. In conclusion, the divine office is that perfect gateway of prayer by which one enters into that communion of the Most Holy Trinity and allows for the one who prays it a deepening of the life of virtue. This is accomplished not simply with the mind, but with the whole body. He is able to offer himself completely to the Father in union with Christ in the Holy Spirit for the sanctification of himself and the world. Let nothing be preferred to the work of God. Thank you.